All right, kids, uh, this will be my walkthrough of your biomes slideshow. And first of all, I wanna thank everybody for doing a really good job. Um, I'm really impressed by your work. I know a lot of you put a lot of work into these. Uh, they were well-researched, well-made, snazzy, high production value, so thanks. Um, one critical comment that I might have for some of you is you don't need to sound like an angry environmentalist in an environmental science class. Um, you don't have to say that humans are messing it all up and surely this will be bad for everybody because humans suck. Um, there's a tone in many of your um, free response answers as well as in this set of slides where I feel like a lot of you are trying to generate the pessimism that you see in some environmentalists and that's not necessarily appropriate and it's definitely not desired by the college board as a matter of fact they kind of dislike that so uh, you're not applying for a job at Greenpeace or something you don't need to sound bitter or uh, pessimistic about environmental issues um, anyway that one critique aside this was a great slideshow thanks um, I tried to make my notes and I came up with six pages. So I don't know how long this is going to be. I'm going to try to go really fast. First, there are these bands around the planet that you should know. They're called the polar, uh, temperate and tropical bands. There's the Northern ones. And then that pattern of course, reverses in the South. So the tropics is in the middle. The temperate zones are 30 to 60 north and 30 to 60 south. And the polar regions are 60 to 90. 90 being the poles. And I just wish we had the time. I have this spectacular demo that I can do in class that helps you understand why we have seasons because seasonality is a really big deal. If you ever get a chance and you can watch a tutorial on YouTube or something, this is one of those enrichment but fundamental science things. If you want to be a scientist, you must be able to explain seasons. Uh, the earth is slanted at an angle and that angle is the same as we go around the sun. So for part of the year, the northern hemisphere is pointing away from the sun and mostly in the dark side of the earth. And part of the year, that same northern hemisphere is pointed at the sun, and thus it's on the brighter side of the earth for more of the day. If you ever get a chance, please watch a YouTube that helps you explain seasons. Um, I can't stress enough how important this is, but I guess we should start from the top. Um, you did great on the tundra. A lot of you had very, very good slides. Um, Oh no, where's my slideshow? Uh, Houston, we have a problem. I think I'm gonna pause this recording for a minute. Well, that was weird, but okay. I think I found it. Um, you did a great job on the Tundra. I wanna thank everybody who made these slides, Eden, Lily, Hudson, Emma, uh, whoever this was didn't put their name on it, not going to get credit. Noah, um, thank you for doing that. A couple things I should add. First, um, we often talk about the tundra as being the Arctic Circle. That's that little ring on the earth that has many days of night in the winter and many days of light in the summer. Uh, the Arctic Circle. Um, you also have to emphasize the extreme nature of seasonality. You can imagine what summer would be like if it was 30 days without darkness and how deep and cold winter would be if there was 30 days of nonstop dark. Tundra regions have extreme seasonality. So there's no year round life. There's like some mice that dig themselves deep under the snow and try to eat storage of seeds. I think that there's like a rabbit or a fox that can live up there. Polar bears hibernate. But anyway, there's nothing out year round and there's certainly no vegetation year round. The vegetation's all annual. Um, a key term is permafrost, permanently frozen soil. That's been mentioned in many of the slides. I should point out that that's also 
tied to some major issues that will later arise in our lessons about tundra. One of them is that as the planet gets warmer, permafrost is melting deeper and deeper with more warm season and more heat. The permafrost is thawing deeper and deeper every year. So dirt that's been frozen for maybe 15 million years or something, 15,000 years, dirt that's been frozen for 15,000 years is starting to thaw. And that means that trapped gases are being released. There's one in particular. When all that stuff decomposes, methane is made. And if you freeze it into ice, that's one thing. But if all the ice melts at once, you have these huge releases of methane gas. That's a big scary thing about tundra, that in a global warming world, as permafrost is melting, methane is being released. We'll come back to this later. Um, I also want to point out that because of that extreme seasonality, it's only a good place to be for a part of the year. So tundra is famous for migrations. A whole bunch of wildlife shows up in the spring when the days are getting warmer and hotter and warmer and hotter and longer and longer and longer and longer. And longer. So all this wildlife moves in. The plants all sprout. They all drop seeds at once. All the ducks get fat on all those seeds and then they fly away as the cold dark winter starts to set in. So migration is a big deal up here. Um, human impacts are mostly mining and oil extraction, but ecologically those aren't necessarily giant. What is a giant human impact is global warming. This is the part of the planet that is warming the most because when you heat the planet, what you're really heating is water. And if you look at these maps, there's a whole lot of water in the Arctic Circle right? The North Pole is floating on water. So all the Earth's heat gain is in the oceans and most of the northern latitudes are just water. So that area is getting the most heat. The majority of global warming is happening at the poles, especially the North Pole. So global warming is a global issue, but the most warming is here in the tundra. Um, there's also a lot of positive feedbacks that occur here. Like when you melt the snow, you expose rocks which are darker, so they heat up more, so you melt more snow. Positive feedback. Um, also, when you start to melt snow, now you've got water which helps the snow melt. So positive feedback again. Um, and on a heating planet, as ice starts to melt into the ocean, that's like breaking a dam that's holding glaciers on much tundra. So that's another positive feedback. Global warming is really scary in the very extreme north. I should also point out that at the edges of the tundra, where that permafrost was already kind of thin, we've built cities on top of permafrost, especially in coastal areas. And as the permafrost is thawing, there's a big problem of sinking cities of the tundra. Okay, next, alpine. Uh, Great job, Julia, Bridget, Ian, uh, Carolina, uh, Josephine. Um, Alpine is something that's really close to my heart. The best place for you to think about is the Sierra. If you've ever been to the Sierra, especially the higher, the, the ridge lines of the Sierra, uh, the peaks around Yosemite, Tahoe, Whitney, if you've been on the ridges of the Sierra, that's Alpine. Alpine is really extreme seasons, but not because of the polar stuff. It's really extreme seasons because of the elevation. You're so far up there that basically you're just in the air. And so atmospherically, because of the elevation, you get really extreme seasons like the tundra. But one big difference is you can see on this map, these are all in lower latitudes, temperate or even tropical. So alpine regions have extreme seasons, but they do have sunlight every day. They don't have that big dark winter. What that means is that alpine regions do support year-round life. There's a whole bunch of vegetation. 
that can try to poke through the snow, try to hold out under the snow for a little stretch and then come back in the spring. The winters aren't that harsh because of your latitude. Um, the most interesting thing that happens in the Alpine that I think you should know is that if you visualize the Sierra, for example, Alpine environment is just mountain tops. And then everything around them is a lower elevation. That's a different biome. So what you've got are these ecological islands. And as our planet gets hotter, the area of warmth rises further and further up. So what's happening is the Alpine mountain tops are shrinking because warmth is reaching further right? Like, you know that many parts of Tahoe now have less snow than they used to historically. Fine example. So there's this concept called islands in the sky, which means ecological islands found at high elevation. It's a very poetic and beautiful thing. Ecology nerds love alpine biomes because they're like little islands in the ocean you have to go really, really far to find another high elevation place. And so you're isolated up there. Those are all unique biodiversity. Plant nerds, insect nerds love the Sierra. And uh, as our planet warms, these are shrinking. And so they're getting more and more stranded, more and more isolated. And we're worried that warmth will climb to the point where a lot of these Alpine communities just disappear. Uh, taiga is aka boreal or boreal. Um, Gabby, thank you. Tucker, thank you. Weird graphics, homie. Um, Ariana, thank you. Um, Benji, I hope you can finish this one. Um, so, um, Taiga, also known as Boreal, we're getting into lower latitudes. You can see on this map, you have left the truly polar regions, but we're still semi-polar. So you still have really strong seasonality, but you're outside of the ring of 30 days of night. Now winter always has some light. So it's still very, very seasonal, but there's sunlight at least a part of the day in the winter, which means trees can survive that winter. They can still get a little bit of sunlight to keep working through the winter days. Um, there is some uh, adapted elevation um, vegetation here. Uh, they're called conifers or evergreens. You might know them as needle bearing trees. And needles are an adaptation to being in the snow because it's so dry, you all get bloody noses when you go to the snow because it's so arid, it's like being in the desert. There's no water in the air because it's all frozen on the ground. Uh, needles are an adaptation for being in a dry environment. They reduce their surface area so they can still get sunlight on the needle, but they don't have a lot of surface area to lose their water in a dry environment. Uh, evergreens grow vertically they compete for sunlight that comes at an angle. So they're all racing to grow tall. And that's why the taiga boreal forests are where we get almost 100% of humanity's lumber. You hear about deforestation in other places, that's not for lumber. Your house is built out of that green spot in Canada in front of you. Uh, my house too. I'm sitting in a place I built with wood that came probably from British Columbia. Um, the conifers is important vocab, the adaptation to being cold. And remember that this is where we get lumber. Uh, all of Europe and Asia, they all get 100% of their lumber from those regions in Siberia and stuff. This is where we have most of the world's total deforestation Surprisingly, it's not the tropical rainforests. And this is where we get the lumber. Tropical rainforest, when it is deforested, is for other reasons. We'll get to that later. 
Uh, next comes the Temperate Deciduous Forest. Uh, Jack, Vanessa, Kristen, um, Connor, um, and Nick. Um, thank you for doing a great job of this. Um, I really like this map. It's really easily visible. You can see in this map, if you think about it, these are like the parts of the world that are the most dominant modern societies. Maybe that's a fair way to say that for better or worse. I'm not attaching value, but you know, Europe, the heart of the United States, the heart of Asia, um, some of the biggest metropolitan parts of South America. Uh, you can see the capital of Australia. Um, temperate deciduous forest is a place where colonial powers felt comfortable. So they really held on to their industrial revolution ways uh, whenever they reached out to new places that matched previous experience. So European clothing and construction and agriculture transferred well to the Americas. That's why the Europeans made it when they landed here. Um, just an interesting cultural note. Um, temperate deciduous forests um, are ecologically important because they are deciduous. The forest loses its leaves. Um, winter is brief. Instead of trying to tough it out here, knowing that there will be many good seasons with sun directly overhead, these trees, instead of growing vertically, they grow out. That takes really strong connections. And the process of dropping the leaves means that the tree will reabsorb all of its minerals and make really good hard wood. So deciduous forests is where we get hardwoods. Um, you know, for building furniture and stuff, jewelry boxes. Um, one of the only reasons that I, that one of the only things I can add um, about deciduous forest is that this biome is almost completely gone. It's totally colonized by humans. You can see the places on this map have about as much history as humans have anywhere in terms of modern development. So cities of Eastern, Central Eastern Asia, Japan, cities of like my capital where I was born in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Um, you can see the uh, Northeastern United States, uh, the colonies, um, old Europe. Uh, this area is totally colonized because humans have been doing modern civilization here. Um, for a really long time. So there's very little native deciduous forest left. It's an almost extinct biome. Grassland, thank you, Shaylee, Shay, Blake, uh, Brendan. Brendan's got formatted funny, so I'll use this one. Um, Something fascinating about temperate grasslands is that you have pretty consistent, like not very extreme seasons, but they are distinct. So if you come from this part of the world, winter is winter and summer is summer and spring is spring and fall is fall. None of those are super crazy extreme, but they are distinct. And this favors the evolution of grasses, which live very quickly. Grasses can sprout, grow, set their seeds, and die in about three months, which is the perfect timing if every three months is distinct. So you've got your spring grasses, then they all die, and you get your summer grasses, and then they all die, and then you get your fall grasses. That's why it's grassland, because of the seasonality. There's rain in every season, so there's grasses specialized for every season. And the key thing for you to know is with four distinct seasons with rain and each one having a period of grasses is that you have growth, uh, death, and decomposition happening four times a year, every year for eternity. So these are 
just constantly accumulating organic material on the ground. The grass falls, new grass grows up. It falls, new grass grows up. It falls, new grass. So that decomposition, you know about mulch in a garden, you're just adding mulch to mulch to mulch to mulch. It's just this giant compost pile. Because grasslands have the world's best topsoil, these maps, this is where humanity grows their food. If you look at that map, those are all the bread baskets. The Canadian bread basket, the American bread basket, the South American, the African, these are the bread baskets. Every one of these grassland maps with a little argument about what's really grassland, each one of them shows you uh, where the continents grow their food. Um, so Chaparral is kind of rad because that's where you live. Look at how rare it is, first of all. Look at this map. Thank you, Lizzie. Look at this map. Thank you, Jack. Um, similar map. Thank you. I can't tell who made this one. Campbell Brown. Uh, look at this map. Uh, Xander. Look at this map. Uh, Andre's map is really tough to see there. Um, I'll use this one. You'll notice a very specific pattern. Chaparral only occurs on the west coast at about 35 degrees, north and south. So if you were to draw a line, you could just stripe across the earth 35 degrees north and 35 degrees south. And where that stripe cause, touches a west coast, that's the only places that have this climate. It's called Mediterranean or Chaparral. And you know this because you live here, right? We have moderate temperatures year round with very rare exceptions. We get like a little heat wave or we get a little cold spell, but pretty much I wear flip flops and trunks like 300 days a year. I'm so excited when I can bring out a hoodie because I think that they're fashionable and comfortable, but I could just never do it because I'm a sweaty bastard. Um, we get all of our rainfall in two or three big hits and that's unique globally we get less rain days than any biome on earth deserts get very frequent rainfall little bits but often you go anywhere else on the planet it rains in the summer here in santa barbara we'll go six seven eight we have gone nine months without a drop of rain in santa barbara that's crazy to have vegetation that lives without any rainfall. Like if you bring cactus from the Chihuahua desert and you put it in Santa Barbara, they die here. You got to water your cactus kids. Our area is extremely unique. We have wildlife that just hunkers down and goes, God, this sucks, this sucks, this sucks. And our vegetation is just pissed and bitter. It's little tiny runt vegetation. That's what chaparral means, chaparro. It's like the short one of the family. It's the, the runt of the litter. Chaparral is little dwarf midget grunt vegetation. Um, you know it, you've been here. We don't have oak trees. We have little oak trees. We don't have like big sages. We have little like knee high sages. Here, our vegetation just goes, ugh. And our vegetation just suffers for like six, seven, eight, nine months. Just like, oh God, this sucks. And then they get hit by the rain and they go, oh, thank God. And they like throw out some flowers and throw out some seeds. And then three months later, they're just like, oh God, it sucks. And they just hate life for another six or seven months. That's ecologically very unique. This is a very weird biome. And you can see there's almost none on this planet. Because we don't have moisture, we can't really support microbes. So we don't have soil. It's a crazy thought, but if you go into our mountains, we basically have sand on top of rocks. And soil is very, very rare unless you have these really delicate late succession communities that have accumulated little pockets of soil like the Santinez Valley or like underneath the grove of oak trees mostly we don't do soil 
which means there's really no nutrient cycling. So our vegetation is very interesting. The chaparral vocab is a fire renewal community, which means fire here is not that dangerous. Most of our vegetation is built to survive the burning because the burning puts nutrients back into the soil, which are never there. So when the rain hits, it's like, hooray, here we go. And all the stuff that got burned down will just grow right back from the roots, make flowers, make seeds, and reproduce. Uh, fire is the primary nutrient cycler in chaparral and Mediterranean. And that's weird because usually decomposers do all the nutrient cycling, but there's nothing to decompose here. We don't have soil. Plants don't usually drop their leaves here. They just barely have leaves. They just sit there and suffer. It's very unique. I mean, look at this vegetation. You know it because this is exactly what my every, like when I go hunting every year, that's exactly what it looks like. Like there are valleys that accumulate soil like this picture or this picture, but generally speaking, no dirt. Very unique, very, very unique. Um, I should point out that humans love this weather. So everywhere on the planet, if you're a rich person, you come live here. That's why Oprah and royalty and all these Montecito people live here. Cause you know, it's like the best place on the planet. If not, they would live in the Mediterranean in Italy. Uh, if you're rich in South America, you live in the Mediterranean there. Um, the richest people in Africa live in that little tiny corner of South Africa that has Mediterranean climate and likewise Australia. Because this is so sought after, it's been developed for a long time. Almost all Mediterranean biome is in private hands and it's very developed. Technically you live in the largest remaining chunk of the rarest biome. When people argue a lot about the Gaviota coast, it's the last piece that big. Uh, that's a compelling argument. It's a teeny little biome that's all full of people, except for a few little chunks. And you can still see those, so you should. Okay. When we enter the tropics, I got to point out, there's basically no more weather. I mean, there's no more seasons, excuse me. There's no more seasons. You'll notice in uh, Lily's uh, graph here, or in Rockwoods, which is the same graph, or in Daisy, which has the same graph, uh, or in Janelle, who drew her own, that the rainfall is consistent. And across the tropics, there is a little bit of temperature variation, but basically, if you look at the range of temperatures, it's from pretty nice to pretty nice. You know, it's like warm to hot. So it's either warm or it's hot and it's just raining constantly. Because there's almost no seasons, at the equator, you get really unique ecology here. Um, every day is warm. Every day is sunny, 12 hours guaranteed. There's no short days. It rains every day. So if you think about it, that's like a nice greenhouse, right? This is the perfect environment for plants to grow. So this is extremely productive. It's, I believe, the most productive terrestrial biome. Uh, really high productivity. Plus it's consistent. So with all this stuff growing, there's all this energy to go around and competition sucks. So in the tropics, you get a whole bunch of diversity because species are splitting to avoid competition. They subdivide niches into really specialized little tiny micro niches. So the tropical rainforest has the most diversity because it's a consistent and productive environment. So you can split it into little pieces. There are frogs that only breed inside rain puddles in one species of plant. And those plants are always there and there's always rain puddles. So that frog species evolved like 15 million years ago and they're still around. 
this is what I mean. You can specialize in the weirdest lifestyle. There are snakes that never touch the ground. They just live in the trees and they lay their eggs in the trees and all they eat is baby birds. But birds breed year round because it's a constant environment. So they always have baby birds to eat. So you can have arboreal snakes that only eat chicks. And there's like dozens of species of arboreal snakes that only eat chicks, by the way. There's some that go to the shady parts of the trees and some that go to the skinny branches on the trees and some that go up to the top canopy in the forest because you can specialize and specialize and specialize. Key fact about the tropical rainforest is consistent, productive, so a lot of specialization, so extreme biodiversity. Very delicate, specialists are picky. They all depend on these variables to always be there. You gotta always have little rain puddles in the bromeliads for that one frog. But that's what's interesting. Super high biodiversity kind of means super delicate because they're all picky, right? Um, something that's interesting to remember is with all this water moving around, there's nothing left in the soil. The plants are always ready to grow. So there are no nutrients in the soil. It's shocking because you look at the vegetation in these slides, look at that vegetation and look at this vegetation. You would think like that's got to be good soil because look at how much stuff is growing, but it's kind of the opposite. Because all that stuff is growing, soil is just washed out. Think about it. That's the only limit to plant growth because tomorrow is going to be warm and there's going to be 12 hours of sunlight and you know you're going to get rain. So the only thing that's stopping the plants from growing is they just can't find any more food. In those conditions, stuff decomposes immediately. So you throw a dead body in this rainforest and it'll be made into trees within four days. You can't even find the bones. There's extreme nutrient cycling, opposite of chaparral. It's extremely rapid and thus the soil is always denuded. Something else that you hear a lot about tropical rainforests is the deforestation. That's real. Tropical rainforest is rapidly being deforested, but it's not why you think. The trees aren't worth anything. They're all weird and crooked and jumbled. They're like waterlogged and full of parasites and holes and they compete with other trees. So they'll, they'll have like diseases and stuff and they're spongy because they grow fast. Plus, imagine trying to drive a lumber truck through this picture. Like, that's horrible. Imagine trying to work in this environment. It's like 100 degrees with moisture and like spiders and mosquitoes and stuff. So nobody goes to the tropical rainforest for lumber. Primary reason to cut down new forest is to mine. And that's usually illegal mining. About one half of the world's goal is gold is mined illegally in almost all that's in the tropics. Um, after the miners get through, people will also dig through the forest for like rare animals, for like exotic pets and stuff. So all the really cool stuff, it's all being picked out by people who are cutting new trails through the forest. And once you can get into the forest, now you might get somebody who goes looking for like a rare hardwood, some weird kind of mahogany or rosewood for like the fretboard on a guitar or something. There's a little bit of logging, but usually that's very selective. One tree for every hundred acres or something. The majority of that deforestation is once you've removed the exotic animals and the miners are done, you've got this network of roads that campesinos can explore, just poor folk that are trying to make a living. And so they'll burn down the forest so that those nutrients give you a couple of years of farming. And after you grow a couple batches of soy that we export to other countries, not much is gonna grow anymore. So you can just let some cows out there to eat any random sprouts. And the really scary thing is we are clearing the forest in a way that it doesn't grow back. Deforestation is not what you think. It's not for logging. It's the stripping of resources. And because of that sequence, the miner, the exotic animals, um, the rare logs, 
then the slash and burn for agriculture, and then the last shot ranching, what you're left with is just sand. And so we're turning tropical rainforest into desert. That's actually a really fascinating detail. This will come up again later too. Savanna is like grassland, but in the tropics. So it's not like four distinct seasons. It's kind of like hot part of the year and less hot part of the year. Uh, thank you, Quentin. Uh, thank you, Seku. Thank you, Nico. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, thank you, Hamilton. Um, you can see that this is in the tropics, but it's grassland. Um, and the only things that I wanted to add to this slide, it's not much, just that there are basically two seasons. And because it's in the tropics, when this grass takes off, it's not like three months of wheat. It's like five months of grass that's like over your head. And what's fascinating, and especially in, in Africa, the savanna crosses the equator. So you have the northern summer followed by the southern summer, followed by the northern summer. So you've got the winter species and the summer species switching places, but migrating across that land mass. That's a very special thing about Africa, that it has savanna spanning the equator. So you have like winter summer species, and then they switch spaces for winter summer in the opposite hemisphere. Those two seasons, make a north and a south migration that are always switching and the wildlife in Africa has to move really far and that's a big deal. That's a huge detail across a lot of international borders. Keep in mind Africa is a continent, not a country. And European colonialists took a whole bunch of societies and split them arbitrarily into countries that contain conflict. So it's really tough for a lot of countries in Africa to talk to each other. That pattern is a major ecology issue in the savanna. Um, the only human impacts here, it kind of sucks for humans. There's not a lot of people there. It's mostly crappy, hard living. Um, so one of the only impacts is we do a really like desperate last chance agriculture, like really extreme and um, a lot of ranching, um, mostly subsistence ranching. This isn't big businesses that we can be mad at. It's uh, people with few other options that we can be mad at. Um, desert is the world's largest biome and humans don't like it. So in environmental science, there kind of isn't a ton to tell you. Thank you, Barrett. Thank you, Mia. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Leah. Uh, thank you, Shaka. Um, one thing you'll notice, though, in most of these climographs is that there's actually rain year round. Like, look at that rain pattern. That's pretty flat. Interesting thing about deserts is that they'll have extreme variation of temperature from day to day. But throughout the year, the temperatures are pretty moderate through most of the world's deserts. Um, you can see in this climatograph, there's some temperature variation. But look, this one doesn't have a lot of temperature variation. Depending on which desert you're looking at, deserts tend to have huge variation from day to night. 110 degrees at day, 28 degrees at night. Huge variation short term but they don't have a ton of seasonal variation depending on your latitude. Uh, deserts are usually found in the middle of the continents. That's a good hint for the college board that they're at the middle of the continents. Deserts have very few coastlines, especially the big ones. They're usually the center of your land masses. Um, it's really tough to adapt to these sorts of conditions. That extreme variation from uh, day to night is really brutal. And that's what makes the water fall and then evaporate right away. So your adaptations in the desert are um, water storage, of course, but hiding 
from extreme temperatures. Um, and so you have a lot of nocturnal stuff, underground stuff, and super insulated stuff. Um, finally, I'd like to point out that deserts are often pictured like this with mostly sand, sand, sand. But most deserts are highly vegetated like this. They're just really specialized to be super rugged. They trap their water. They collect water every single day, just a little spritz. Middle of summer, middle of winter, just little spritz. Sand dunes like this are actually pretty rare. Most deserts are vegetated. Um, and that's why our biggest impact there is grazing. I gotta take a break. Um, if I don't break up this video, it won't load. So I'll be back with another video in just a minute to do the aquatic stuff.